Hi, I'm Victor M. Sweeney, licensed mortician. We're here at Corsmo Funeral Service. Come on in. We've been given unprecedented access to the whole funeral home. We're gonna go into the prep room where we embalm and prepare bodies. Normally, uh, if a person from the outside like yourself wanted to go into the prep room, they wouldn't be allowed. We've been given special access today from the Department of Health. And we're going to look at caskets, urns, that kind of stuff. We're gonna to get to see the funeral chapel, and then we'll also get to take a tour of the hearse, see how that works. With us today is Sean. Victor. Thanks for having me here. I really Thanks appreciate it. Death can be kind of scary. There's a lot of things about our, our field that are unknown. I'm excited for you to bring those answers to everyone today. First, we're gonna go inside the prep room. Why don't you come with me and I'll show you what we do. So here we are in the prep room, the room where we do all the embalming. Embalming is meant to sanitize and preserve bodies as well as provide some level of restoration. So for instance, if someone is grievously injured, we can kind of work to reconstruct them, um, in addition to making sure that their body holds up for maybe the week that we have in between the time when they die and the time when we have the funeral. In this funeral home, the prep room is off of the garage. I don't want to be uh, bringing cots with bodies on them up or down stairs or through the whole funeral home to get them here, because then we can go right from the van to the room where the magic happens. We've taken our dummy mic from the back of the van. And now we are ready for the embalming. Every time you prepare a body, you kind of start from zero. So you're going to do inventory, you're gonna look them over, you're gonna make sure that you know everything about their condition, and then adjust your embalming processes accordingly. In a normal situation, I'm covered from head to toe with personal protective equipment, and that's mainly to keep me safe when I'm dealing with blood and pathogens. I'm also dealing with embalming fluids. Uh, so these are things that keep bodies preserved and sanitized, and a lot of these contain aldehydes. These are actually toxic chemicals. Every prep room is going to have ventilation, it's going to have formaldehyde level monitoring. All these things are in place to keep me safe and uh, to make sure that we don't infect our public spaces with what we have to do here in private. One of the first steps of embalming is, is setting the features, so making the face into a, a natural expression. These are called eye caps. Sometimes when people die, their eyes are open and we can position the eyelids and have them stay that way. We use this device called the needle injector that actually punches these sharp brads into the upper and lower jaw, kind of keep it in place, they'll stay that way. The next part of embalming after we set those features is we're going to do what's called arterial embalming. So we're gonna gain access to the arteries and then that's how we're going to use our embalming machine to pump fluids in. So there are three different kinds of fluids that embalmers use when preparing a body. The first arterial solutions are going to be fixatives. So they're going to sanitize the body, they're going to preserve it, and they're going to fix it into place. Other fluids are what we call co-injection or accessory fluids. Co-injections might add fluid to tissue, they might draw fluid out, they'll add color, sometimes maybe a rosiness is helpful. And then we have other fluids that uh, are really good at preventing certain types of decomposition. Probably the most common place for a funeral director to gain access to an artery is right up here in the neck, and that is called the uh, carotid artery. Let's say you choose not to raise the carotid artery. You can actually embalm a whole body right here from the leg. So the femoral artery is one of the largest arteries that we have access to. If you push fluid up, you can open the corresponding vein, and then the blood will drain out. And arteries are interesting because they're very rubbery. Think like a, like a tube rubber band. And so when we put high pressure into them with the embalming machine, they're able to withstand that. The fluid just goes right into the body. 
So this tank here is the embalming machine and this tube goes right down the artery and then is gonna shoot fluid in at a high pressure in order to circulate that fluid through while pushing out the blood that's been pooling in the venous system. So this will actually simulate something of a heartbeat. So if you have large clots that are stuck in a venous system, you can pulse the fluid through at a high pressure and push those clots out of the body and that'll create better distribution for our fluid and better preservation in the final procedure. This one is called a tissue spreader. So let's say you have someone with a little extra weight and you need to get into, let's say, the, the meat of their leg to gain access to their artery. This guy you can put in like this and it spreads out all that fat. Any number of handy scissors. A curve is nice sometimes, especially as you're uh, cutting through arteries or maybe other uh, tissue. This is called an aneurysm hook because it's used for separating tissue and hooking the arteries and pulling them out where you have access to them. This is called a groove director. I can hold this, put it into the artery, and then this hard surface in the bottom is gonna open up the artery so I can slide my other tools right in. An angular forceps, this you can actually use to pull out clots. This guy is called a drain tube. Typically, this end here is going to be hooked up to another tube that we run down the table, and then this end, is going to go inside the artery. One thing that's great about a drain tube is that we can actually control how much blood leaves the body. If we're having drainage issues, you can stop it. Pressure is building in the body, and then all of a sudden, you'll pull the, the end and whoop, it'll come pouring out the bottom. So you wanna create that pressure, because sometimes you need a little extra to get into the extremities, like into the toes or the fingers, something like that. Cavity embalming is the second part of preparing a body in which we want to puncture all the hollow organs and then drain out all the goo and nastiness that wants to live in there. So the tool we're going to use to do that is called the trocar. The trocar is a great big steel spear. This tip is going to puncture the organ and then this part is actually hooked up to a vacuum. So it's going to suck all that goo right down the drain. And then the holes that we make will actually uh, provide access points for introducing what we call cavity fluid. So embalming fluid that's made to uh, kill all the bacteria and solidify those hollow organs so we don't have any issues down the road. This is a trocar as well. It's slightly different in that it doesn't suck fluid out, but puts fluid back in. So in this case, we'd take a bottle of cavity fluid, we would actually twist it in and attach it to the top of the trocar, and then right through that same hole we made before, we go back in, all the while gravity is actually drawing the fluid down and inserting that from the end of the tip back into all the holes we made, into the heart, into the lungs. And then you'll go around, back down into the abdomen. This is really, the lower part is where all the bacteria like to hang out. And that, my friends, is how you embalm a body. When I embalm my first body, it, it is kind of scary, kind of unnerving, because it's one of those things you have to do right the first time and you only get one chance. So if you screw up and maybe pressure is too high and the face starts to swell and you don't see that, you've caused a problem with grandma or grandpa that you can't really fix. So attention to detail is everything. Welcome to the selection room. If you have a loved one that passes away, odds are good you'll end up in a room just like this to select your funeral merchandise. When a family chooses cremation, family might want to select an urn. And these range all over the place. There are simple urns that maybe start at $100 or less. They're really fancy, maybe uh, cast bronze ones that are hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Or some families just opt to use the container that comes from the crematory, just a simple plastic urn. Any one of those is perfectly suitable for what a family wants to do. So one thing that can kind of be confusing and is often used interchangeably is the difference between a casket and a coffin. In other parts of the world, uh, like in the UK, for instance, they have what are called coffins. So these are what we might call uh, anthropoid shapes. So they're narrow at the top where the head is, they widen out at the shoulders, then they come back in again towards the feet, whereas caskets are uniformly rectangular. In the United States, we used almost exclusively caskets. Caskets vary as widely as you can possibly imagine. 
we have very simple cardboard cloth covered caskets that might be more suitable for a, a simple burial or maybe cremation. And then we have high end caskets made from uh, hardwoods like mahogany or cherry or even bronze caskets. Variety is, is really the, the spice of death here. Here we are in the funeral chapel. We've taken our dummy Mike, and now we're ready for his family to come and, and say their final goodbyes. This opening here is called a cap, and this is an example of what we call a half couch casket. So you're only going to see uh, from about the midsection up. You should note every person in the casket is wearing pants, but not always shoes. When we go to close a casket, um, oftentimes I have the deceased family around me. There's a locking mechanism under here, and we're just going to simply pull that up. We'll open the latches here at the bottom. And then with the family, we'd all grab hold, we slowly lower the lid, and then we say goodbye. As a last step, um, I'll have you come with me as we load the casket into the hearse, and we'll make our way to the cemetery. Come on. Oh, this is such a cool one. Oh, look at the lights on the inside. You have a great hearse, Sean. So the vehicle behind me, some call it a hearse, some call it a coach, but in any case, it gets the deceased from point A to point B. There's some special things about a hearse. The first thing you should know is that every single one is custom built. So there's not a single company that makes hearses right off the line. Every one is made with a normal car, cut in half, extended, and totally rebuilt. You do not need a special license or anything to drive a hearse. Being built on Lincolns and Cadillacs, usually they have nice big engines and they go well over 100 miles an hour if needed. On the back end, they, they normally have a, a vinyl top, at least in the States. That swooshy design on the back is called a Landau bar. It's kind of the, uh, the quintessential mark of a hearse. It's a remnant from when they used to be coaches, so horse-drawn carriages, and the top would pull back. Today, we don't have convertible hearses, but it's a nice mark when you see one, you know exactly what it is. So one thing you'll notice about a hearse is that the door opens really wide. So when you have six casket bearers, you can get nice and close before you put the casket on the rollers. And the rollers go all the way inside, so it's a nice, smooth uh, roll into the hearse. When you get the casket in place, you're gonna take this stopper, put it just like this, and keep the casket so it doesn't go flying out of the back. When I load a hearse, I always go head first. Uh, the reason being, when you tilt the casket a little bit to get it in, then their feet are down, and if they slide, they slide towards their feet. Whereas if you flipped it around the other way, they'd be going head first, and it's awfully heavy. So always the heavy head end first, and uh, the feet will follow. Well, why don't we try loading it up with our, with our friend Mike. We've taken him from point A, now let's go to point Z, and uh, Sean is gonna help me here. I so appreciate you coming with me on this trip today through the funeral home. I hope you've learned some things and that maybe you feel a little bit more comfortable as you come with me on my life with the dead.